There's five speakers here who are going to introduce themselves shortly. Um, before we do, I just want to say that this conversation is going to span everything from structural inequality in photojournalism to sexual harassment, sexual assault, and the impact that this lack of diversity has on the stories that we tell. And um, we all know these problems exist, so we want this conversation to be as forward-looking as possible. So hopefully in your questions and insights that you guys contribute in the second half, um, that will also come across. Um, when we talk about building a better industry, it's not just an industry that's not rife with harassment and assault. There's so much more to it than that. Um, according to a recent study, only about 15% of working news photographers are women. Um, around 90% of the lead images on the New York Times front page last year were shot by men. Um, the Associated Press, which has one of the world's largest news photo agencies, is has a photo staff that's 86% male and more than 80% white. And so these are some of the things that we're going to be talking about and how a culture of sexual harassment and assault and silencing all contribute to pushing women out. Um, before we go into that, so uh, just start at the far end. Everyone's going to introduce themselves. Ah, yes. Thank you for having me here. I'm Lars Boring. I'm the managing director of World Press Photo, which is probably the, the main prize for photojournalism uh, since uh, 1955. <coughs> we share the stories that matter to a worldwide audience, um, and um, but we are much more than a contest. I think we should serve uh, as a as a leadership role in um, also making good changes in this industry, or at least make them uh, available to talk about. Uh, not just talk, but, but, but real action. And so one of the things you mentioned is uh, when I took on this job three and a half years ago, I found out that only 15% of the participating photographers were female photographers. And so I said, this is uh, not right, and uh, we actively have to do something about this and find out what uh, what is the cause of this and, and, and how we can change that. Um, so it's one of these examples and uh, and so recently I also uh, spoke out uh, spoke out about Me Too uh, also because I think uh, we need to have more awareness of it and also to make sure that it really changes uh, and action should speak louder than words. My name is Anastasia Taylor Lind. I'm a freelance photojournalist and um, I am one of the uh, almost 50 women that spoke to Kristen Chick uh, for her Columbia Journalism Review article that revealed um, some pretty damning incidents of sexual assault and harassment. And beyond that, um, or the, the inaction of many in our community um, to <coughs> to speak about what's going on. I mean, like I'm here because I want to keep talking about sexual harassment and assault and photojournalism. Um, I think unless we talk about it, we, I mean, unless we're willing to talk about it, then there's no way we're ever going to really address the issue. Um, and, and in the several months since I, uh, since Kristen's article came out and, uh, I, I was named in that. Um, I had, of course, intellectually been aware of um, sexism and gender inequality and uh, sexual harassment in our industry, but I hadn't quite understood the scale of it, um, how many women uh, are, are being abused by men in our industry. Um, and of course, once you say something, then other people share their stories too, right? So I had been very naive in that instance. And I had also been quite um, naive. One of the things that surprised me most was that so few leaders in our industry are prepared to talk about this publicly, um, to talk about it and, and affect change. Um, and yeah, the other, the other thing that came up was just reporting. Like I didn't have anybody to tell about what happened to me, and there is still nobody to tell, except Kristen for now, so I hope that's something we can figure out too. I'm Kristen Chuck. I seem to be the only one who can't figure out my microphone, so I apologize for that. Um, I am um, a freelance journalist, a writer, not a photographer, and um, 
I did write the Columbia Journalism Review story about sexual harassment in photojournalism, and um, it's uh, something I'm still reporting on and following up, particularly the um, institutional response to the problem, and um, that's why I'm here. I'm Finbar O'Reilly. I'm an independent photographer, and I've also worked uh, in large news organizations as well over the years. And um, I'm here really because Anastasia invited me to be here, and also because it's essentially an extension of all the private conversations that I've been having with friends, male and female, over the last uh, couple of years, really. And um, and uh, this is, as far as I know, one of the sort of first public events of this kind where we're having this conversation and trying to figure out um, what to do practically uh, about creating a, a safer but also more inclusive environment for, for journalists. And um, certainly this, this Me Too movement, if we want to call it that, is being driven by women. But I also am curious to what my role can be in, in contributing to this and, and the role of other men. And, as I look around the room, there aren't many men in here, um, and that's kind of an issue. So hopefully, by engaging with this subject, uh, that might encourage other men to engage in the subject as well, because it's really important for us to do that. Hi, um, I'm Yumna, and I am a photographer and a filmmaker, and um, I have a background in journalism, but I've, I guess I've recently decided to take a little break an extended break from journalism because of all of the issues at hand that we're speaking about. Um, and within my experiences, I realized that there really is no place for women to go as freelancers to seek support um, when they do experience something without having to be afraid of going public and damaging their career further. And um, I think effectively that also silences journalism from women of color, which is a huge problem in the industry, in many industries, of course. And so I guess I'm here to have a conversation to talk about where we go from here, and rather than just speaking about the problems, but find solutions. Thanks, everyone. Um, Christian, maybe we could start with you, since your article is basically what kicked off this conversation among freelance photographers. Um, can you summarize a little bit what, you, what came out of that reporting, because it was about 10,000 words, if I remember, um, and what kind of response you've seen since. Um, yeah, so I, I spent, um, I think, almost six months speaking to uh, more than 50 um, photojournalists and people in the industry, and, and it was, I think, um, what I wrote about was something that we all know, which is that sexual harassment is a huge problem in the industry. Um, and I focused on some of the um, some of the particular problems, which are the the lack of accountability that comes with um, freelancers, and um, and some of the structural and uh, systemic problems. And um, I think we've seen a range of responses and non responses uh, since the article was published. Some of the institutions that were that were named in the article um, have made changes. The Eddie Adams workshop was was mentioned in the story, and they've um, revamped their um, their workshop this year. They made some pretty um, serious changes, and um, and I've I've heard from attendees this year that things have been uh, a lot different than they were in the past. So so there have been some positive changes. Um, there's also agencies like the the Seven Photo Agency was was named in the in the article, and um, the agency suspended uh, the member who was named um, and promised an investigation into his actions and also an independent review of, of the agency itself. And um, a few months later, they, they you know, announced that they accepted uh, the resignation of, of the member with a two-line press release and there appears to have been no investigation into his actions and there has been no word of the independent review that the agency promised into its own the way that it handles um, this issue. It's just been completely dropped. Um, so, you know, there's, and, and then there's a lot of publications that, um, and institutions that haven't said anything. Um, you know, I hear that things maybe are happening behind the scenes. Editors aren't commissioning certain mm -hmm. photographers, but um, there really hasn't been a lot of 
institutional response in, in terms of um, publicly implementing reporting protocols, um, figuring out how we can protect freelancers. Um, those kinds of issues that I raised uh, in this story are, are still huge problems. Laz, is that something you can talk about, um, how you've gone about implementing these kinds of protocols at WordPress for Two, which is one of the few institutions that has spoken out about this issue? Yeah. Well, I think we started internally uh, talking about uh, diversity and uh, finding out what uh, what we mean with diversity, because uh, there's there's uh, I was we talk about the kaleidoscope of diversity, but uh, let's say internally for the staff, uh, we put in place uh, a person that uh, they could speak to, and recently we also started to talk about uh, let's say external contacts that they have. Because internally, that's your your responsibility as well. But but also when you send out your team into the world to build exhibitions, uh, and uh, this is all over the world in more than 60 countries, um, you have to be, let's say, aware of the fact that something can happen, and uh, there needs to be a safe place for them to to talk about. Uh, well, that's that's the organization. The other, but the the the, the main challenge is uh, there's no protocol uh, or no place to go for ph and photographers to, to speak about these uh, issues or these things that happen to them and I've spoken to many of them and I um, I also don't know uh, many times where to put it uh, because there are some very uh, let's say dramatic stories out there and um, I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg and so I think one of the main goals for the near future is to find uh, out how we can create a space like that or a person or something like that which can serve as a uh, place where we can aggregate and see how big this really is. Uh, so you, you do a lot but it's never enough um, and uh, you also find out that uh, you're actually scouting out uh, new territory for yourself and your organization. And the more you talk about it, the more uh, things come towards you. And uh, I'm not saying this is never ending or it's uh, so big that uh, it will engulf everything, but I think it's very important that we do address it and that we do talk about it. And so I think also being here is one of these moments where you can really do that. I think, personally, I feel a responsibility to do it. Yeah. What kind of reaction have you had from speaking out about it? And what advice would you give to institutions that do want to take a leadership role in this issue? Well, I think, first of all, you have to acknowledge that there is a problem, right? I think awareness is something that is super important, that <coughs> people, are, people downplay this a lot. You know, it's been hide, hidden for a long time, and even now people come to me and say, ah, oh, come on. Guy, you know, it's it's not so bad, and then you you give them clear examples without ne mentioning names, and they some of people turn pale, um, and then they're like, oh, I didn't know it was so bad. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work to be done on awareness, um, but um, yeah, to, where do you go from there? Um, one of the things that Kristen, you mentioned, is the fact that photojournalism as an industry is moving towards using freelancers more and more. So about, I think about 79% of the industry is made up of freelance photojournalists. Um, what kind of problems does that cause? Um, maybe it's something that Anastasia and Yumna can speak to um, from your own personal experience, and then we can talk about what mechanisms we could put in place. Um, do you want to start, Anastasia? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Who do we tell? I mean, this is the first barrier, I think. Like, if something happens, who do we tell? Yeah. And there, it stops dead. So, at the moment, we're relying, I think institutions and individuals are relying solely on freelance investigative reporting, Kristen's article, but there have been others as well who's by, who, um, who have exposed sexual predators and then pushed institutions afterwards to name them or to reveal the real reasons that those people were let go. But I think that that's the, the biggest challenge. Um, and so who do you report it to? Well, you could report it to the the institution that represents that person, 
perhaps the agency or the magazine they're working for if they are working for someone. But you know, if, if I behave badly and I'm not on assignment and I'm not employed by anyone, who would you report my behavior to? So I don't have any solutions for that right now, um, but it can't be tenable to keep relying only on other freelancers <laughs> to hold an industry accountable when there are people quite literally whose job it is to protect their colleagues. Yeah, I mean, they're, at being a freelancer and having been on the field and experiencing a situation in which it really hit me like a ton of bricks that there was nowhere to go and that I would basically either come out publicly with using my name and my audience that I've created as a photographer to be just a victim, therefore jeopardizing my entire career and everything that I've built thus far, and, or, I mean, or just leaving the industry entirely, which was also not a solution for me. I mean, I want to keep doing the work that I'm doing, but I also don't want to constantly be labeled as a victim, and I also don't want to feel as though that I mean, I'm going to lose, you know, the month's rent if I don't continue on the assignment. So, I mean, I'm not represented by a photojournalism agency, and so many photojournalists are not represented by photojournalist agencies. So, how is the law, how are institutions, how are these things played into effect when freelancing is such a huge part of photography, not just in journalism, but I mean, in every aspect of photography now? We are independent, and we have no resource, and we have no unions to come into each other and help one another in that sense. Yeah. I think one, one of the biggest problems is that uh, the industry is super immature. Uh, Mark Doza, he's a Dutch professor doing research, and actually he, uh, and the University of Amsterdam, but there's hardly any research done on freelance. We all talk about freelance, everybody's a freelancer, everybody should sort it out, but there's no research, there's no knowledge about freelancing, there's, there's hardly any uh, uh, institutions uh, thinking about it, there's no universities looking at it. So uh, in an area of uh, what a freelancer is, you're actually already talking into sort of uncharted territory, which means there's no structure, there's nothing, there's no knowledge which puts you as a freelancer in a huge disadvantage. Uh, that's one, but the other one is of course uh, the, uh, the imbalance of power. If you all uh, fight, uh, what we do know about freelancers is that they don't make much money, but they're very happy to do what they do. I mean, that's one of the few things which always kind of thinks is kind of nice, but it's also kind of still also problematic. And so this, this imbalance of power um, is is really working against you in this issue uh, in many ways because uh, there's nothing to fall back on nobody to talk to nothing there's no union of freelancers that's why you're a freelancer I guess but, uh, so how how can you sort that out and, uh... Kristen you have a kind of high altitude view of this issue do you have any suggestions for what mechanisms could be put in place to protect freelancers or if, if we're too far away from that, what can individuals do to push institutions to make changes? I think that um, publications, um, institutions, need to think about ways that freelancers can report misconduct to them. So, um, you know, agencies and, and institutions, publications, need to have uh, to come up with a reporting protocol if they don't already have one. Uh, everyone should have one, a way that people can safely and confidentially report misconduct and not to someone who can, um, who can take their career. You know, that report needs to be able to be made not to the head of the agency that you want to work for someday. Um, you need to feel safe making a report. And those mechanisms need to be open not just to employees of that organization, but to, to anyone. So, you know, a, a publication that, that commissions photographers, um, they need to make that kind of reporting available, not just for their um, staff photographers, but also for the freelancers they work with. Um, and I think that editors need to make it publicly known. I mean, if they care about it, if they care about, you know, keeping 
female photographers safe, I think that they should make it publicly known that they want to receive reports of misconduct if it is happening, and that women should feel safe to report it, and they should implement a mechanism for that. I mean, that's one way that I, I think it's very um, doable, and it could be done, and I don't see that happening. Often, uh, though, of course, as is now being revealed through through freelance reporting, women have reported bad behavior to institutions and organizations, and they have not acted on them, and in some instances, they've actively covered it up. Um, and I, um, I have a quote here um, that uh, there was a panel, um, a Women in the World panel last year um, in which Gretchen Carlson, a former Fox News anchor, and her lawyer, um, Nancy Erica Smith, talked about this issue of reporting. I, I, I'll read it to you here. Um, uh, so, yet, even when speaking out, the panel noted it's important to be tactical about who you speak to. Um, Smith warned about the problems, quote, with some human resources departments. HR is not your friend, she said. Only call HR that if you think it would be a good idea to call the KGB to complain about Putin. <laughs> so I I don't um you know I don't know if how we get around that problem. That's absolutely true, and I think you know it that we have to reach a, a place where where institutions are taking this seriously for for people to feel safe to report because. You know, some agencies now are saying we've implemented a code of conduct and we haven't received any reports of misconduct. Like, we're doing so well. And, you know, the truth is that people don't feel safe to report. Um, there are There is misconduct happening you know, with members of those agencies and it just hasn't been reported because who wants to put their career on the line to do that? So, yeah, we those structures need to be created, but obviously um, the, a lot has to be done before people can feel safe. In the absence of kind of institutional protocol, um, and I guess people believing that justice is not going to happen if they report it, one of the things that has had a lot of attention in the last years was for networks. So um, one of the most famous examples is the shitty media men list, um, which there were people involved in the photojournalism industry on that list. Um, those networks tend to just be people kind of passing on what are open secrets. Um, and they are a way for women to defend themselves. They're not really a way to take action because inherently, by being part of a whisper network, you have to be silent about the perpetrator too. You can't, it's not about speaking up, it's about protecting other women. Um, these networks get a lot of criticism for bypassing due process. Um, they often get dismissed as rumor and gossip um, that's a reaction that I've heard from people in institutional and uh, in in positions of power. Um, I'm sure it's one that other people have heard here too, that institutions can't take action because it's just gossip. Um, Kristen, this is something that we've spoken about before. Do you, what do you think are the benefits and drawbacks of whisper networks in this kind of vacuum of justice that's happening at the moment? Um, well, I think they, like you're saying, they exist for only one reason, and that's because there's no institutional action. And, um, you know, the, the reason they exist is to keep women safe, and um, so the benefit of them is that they can help women warn one another about predators and, and help women stay safe. The drawbacks are that a lot of people can be excluded from whisper networks, you know. Um, they allow perpetrators to, to keep on um, behaving badly. Um, women of color can often be, if they're marginalized already, they're not going to be part of that whisper network and they're going to be um, more vulnerable uh, because they don't know who the perpetrators are. So there are a lot of drawbacks, um, you know, and the answer is institutional action. Um, just a note on that, I mean, inherently the, the work of journalism involves so many people that are not involved in any institution whatsoever and you have fixers you have people who are drivers you have just so many people who are just people that you're throwing cash out to help you out and just make the job happen and in those scenarios there is no institution to go to you just have to be able to by word of mouth in this day and age by women, I mean, we all have to kind of just help each other, and I think that that's 
where men really come in and, and have some sort of role to say when they see something and when they, when they are interacting with other men who are, or women who are perpetrating some sort of violent act or sexual act, um, to, to be able to use that privilege that women so often do not have. Um, to do something about that and also to report it to the industry that oftentimes they are represented by because we oftentimes are just not represented at all, especially as women of color, we don't have any representation. So um, the privilege of men in these industries is so incredibly important to be able to not only call out those actions but force those institutions to do something about it and also to create networks in which we can feel safe operating within and also to to allow our careers to not be completely demised by reporting misbehavior and i think lars has uh, lars and um <laughs> finbar have a lot to say about this finbar do you want to talk a bit about your journey in the last year i guess of hearing these stories come out yeah i mean i suppose what's interesting for me is um I come from that position of privilege. I'm the white male photographer that represents the largest part of the photojournalism demographic. And for the longest time, I was pretty blind to a lot of these problems. And I didn't really think about them. And, and certainly the issues that you've raised and that Anastasia's raised while working in the field are just not even things that come into my mind when I'm working. Certainly, I, I, if I'm in, in conflict situations or, or uh, countries with insecurity, I have to think about my personal safety on certain levels, but never once in my life in the field have I even thought twice, once, or any at all about my physical safety in, this, in, a, in the same ways that, that women have to do. And so, you know, when I think when we started first started talking about this a couple of years ago, I was probably as the way that many men were, and many probably still are, thinking that, okay, yeah, well, maybe. Um, but I work with so many female photographers that I don't necessarily even see that, because I, I see them as being equals. And until people started actually putting the numbers in front of me in terms of this many photographs on the front pages are by men, and this tiny percentage are by women, this many photographs are submitted to World Press or win World Press Awards, and these are the actual physical numbers. Um, that's just speaking about diversity. Then when it comes to sexual assault or harassment, that's a whole other realm that I, I couldn't even really get my head around. And, and sometimes it's still difficult to, because you and I have known each other for a long time, but never did I know that you'd had these experiences that were reported in this story that Kristen wrote. And so, I think, um, I think as I said before, the, this, this movement is being driven by women, and men really have to acknowledge, as, as Lars said, that this is an issue, and aside from you know, not being predators ourselves, we have to figure out what our role is in this industry. And I think all of us probably are a bit hesitant, I've been hesitant at times to, to know how to get in, involved or be engaged and to be um, somebody who can speak for, or sort of speak with, or stand with women without seeming like I'm standing for them or speaking for them. Um, and so it's really trying to figure out where to tread, how to tread, and um, I suppose in some sense, I feel like I need, and probably other men feel like they need some guidance on how they can be better and how they can contribute in a positive way to making the industry better. Um, and I think, also, there is a certain reluctance to acknowledge the problem because um, there is perhaps, you know, men close ranks, there is perhaps a fear of, of losing that privilege on some level, even though it's a far, we're far from that actually happening, but there is that threat, there is that risk. Um, we've had it so good for so long, um, and this is how it's been, but really, you know, one of the reasons I'm here is I don't want to just see the world reflected back to me the way that I see it. I want to see it the way you see it, or the way you see it, or, or any other photographer from a different gender, race, or, or socioeconomic background, or experience in the military, or whatever that difference of, of perspective might be. Um, my understanding of the world that I'm moving through is going to be that much richer if we have that diversity. Um, and so I suppose my question that I ask, because I'm representing nobody here but myself, um, but it's a question that other men um, may have, is 
how actually, apart from some of the things you said about intervening or reporting when we have an opportunity to, but really how can we, and it's a question you know, maybe we can address today, is, is, is how can people like me, people who want to do something but aren't sure how to always engage correctly, what practically can we be doing to move things in the right direction? Yeah, and Anastasia and Yimna, would you be able to give some examples of what has meant, like what has made an impression on you in terms of male allyship or what you would like to see more of? Um, what would help you feel like you had more support in this industry? Um, I think my natural reaction is just competition to men, so maybe I'm not the best to respond to that. But I, it, on what he's said is, um, I think for institutions to take some sort of stand just because diversity is such an important topic to them at this moment is that by not protecting women in this industry, you are therefore not allowing diversity to happen within your grounds. And I think that's maybe the best way to approach it on an industrial level and maybe even on a lawmaking level and policy making level in terms of freelancers and people who are not represented by industries is that you're you're never going to be able to achieve diversity if you have people like me who are constantly leaving the industry because we are afraid that we don't have protection and our lives are on the lines when we're just getting paid a few hundred bucks or a few thousand dollars to just do a story um, and you're silencing those voices and they can't be they can't have, you know, silenced women of color nowadays. I mean, it's just not okay for their industry. But um, a Me Too are speaking out, it's like, we'll deal with that later, you know? So maybe it's reshaping those conversations to put those things in perspective. Um, but, um, yeah, and also, like, beyond, I mean, I really do think, just to echo, reiterate that one more time, I really, really do think we need leadership from like people at the top of our industry, people who represent big organizations, magazines, the World Press Photo, uh, which is why I'm so delighted that you're here, Lars. Um, I think we've got a real lack of leadership, and um, I have a lot of private conversations with men and women who represent <coughs> that portion of our industry, and they and they are supportive privately, but not publicly. Um, and typically I hear the HR or the PR departments of the organizations that they work with do not allow them to speak publicly about this. But I think it's gonna take some courage to change this. I mean, it's certainly taken courage on behalf of everybody else who's decided to talk about this and tackle it head on. And I think we need courage from people in leadership roles as well but we also all have small powers ourselves even at the bottom of the pile as a freelance photographer i have some small powers to affect change through conversations that i have with my friends and one of the things i think we can all do is um have those really difficult conversations with our friends who behave badly because it's not true that this is just a load of sex pests sitting on the peripheries of our industry behaving badly and then we can just throw them under the bus and the problem is dealt with. Really dealing head on with sexual harassment means having hard conversations with people who are our friends, people who who we like and who have been part of our lives for a long time and calling them out on their shitty behavior. Um, because it's not enough just to have conversations with people who agree with us or who see the world from the same viewpoint, right? So I think we can all have those difficult conversations with our friends, call them out, and also ask about it. We're journalists. When we hear rumors, rumors, I don't, you know, the Whisper Network, when we hear reports of um, incidents of harassment and assault, we can just check it out. Ask people, hey, I heard that. I mean, we're, that's what we're trained to do, so. Right. Yeah, and I've been really grateful in my position when people have come to me with those stories because people assume that people in positions of power know this stuff and they don't always. Like, I didn't hear any of the things until people came and told me directly. And then you have an opportunity to do due diligence or to raise it with someone who can. 
Um, I'm not in a position to decide everybody that time hires or doesn't hire, but um, I also have a duty of care to the people that we do hire to not put them in positions where they're vulnerable. Um, and there are so many things that, as editors, if there are any editors watching this from afar as well, um, there are so many things we can do to address inequality on a, on a basis that's quantifiable. Like, ed I know editors at Time who keep spreadsheets of who they're hiring and color code them based on race and gender and sexuality and all the things that we can measure so that we are being a more representative media for more for people who need it um, those are that takes more work like there's no denying it that lots of people don't want to do that because journalists are all overworked and underpaid already and probably don't want to add like making a spreadsheet to their list of things to do but it's a satisfying thing to look back on it at the end of a year and be like oh <coughs> we've improved we've hired more people of color this year we've like made sure that in all the stories, reporters are actually making an effort to quote women and not just like the three men they always call for a story. There are so many things that we can all be doing. Um, and I think one of the questions that I had was like, what to do when the Whisper Network comes to you? Because sometimes p victims don't want their stories to be out there either. They, and then you're in no position to, to spread their story. Um, but often those whispers get forwarded on. Um, in this industry, it's so small and it's so sociable that all of us, at some point, either already have or will come into contact with a story about someone who we know, like, have worked with, dated, like, it's a, it's a small industry. Um, and I guess I, if anyone feels like they can talk about it, um, how do you handle that situation and how do you approach someone whose behavior you've heard about? Because that's something that most people are, are grappling with at the moment. Just, just to stray from that, just on the previous note, um, on what we can do as individuals, as freelancers, um, before we get to that, if you don't mind, um, I often find that in any industry, women are very, very fucking cautious about the jobs that we receive, so we do not take a stand to say, we take this out of our contracts before we sign them and we expect more of a raise and from this point on I've demanded that I have clauses in my contracts that state that I am allowed to leave a situation if I find myself uncomfortable and I do not have to change um, my reporting and I can still expect that my privacy is kept and that my payment is dealt with and I'm sure that men oftentimes have no problem asking for changes in their contracts and I think that that's really important as women to understand that we have that right and by doing that we allow our clients to understand that this is something that's very serious and that they have to be aware of as women. If we take that stand to amend our own contracts and to, to even put forward contracts ourselves and say these are what we, these are our, our grounds for working, um, then we're, we're not only helping ourselves and saving ourselves, um, but we're also allowing clients to understand that this is something that needs to be spoken about and thought about and um, protected on our end. So as an individual, if you are a woman and you are working in these fields, do not be afraid to make red lines and contracts and make your own notes and stand your ground for what you will and will not do because we are constantly doing shit that we really shouldn't be doing and we have a right and a protection personally to be able to say no. Um, so, yeah. But on the other point, that's really helpful. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't do that. I'm going to. Yeah. And I hardly ever get any. Um, I mean, it's, it's across the board, I'm sure all editors experience this, but almost all men always ask for more money when you assign them and women don't. And yeah, even asking for payments and people will do stuff for free and not ask. People won't push back and ask for changes to contracts. So. Yeah, it's good to think Important. about. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I led us astray from the last point that you made, but maybe one of you guys could. What happens? <coughs> what happens when? The yeah, how do you call out you bad behavior? Do you have? Does anyone here have any experiences of doing that that they can share? Because I think it's something that people struggle to think about how to start those conversations. Uh, what, what we do uh, in my organization is when we hear things, we check and we act. Uh, so when we find out that uh, a story is true, then we make sure that we don't work with a person like that anymore. Uh, <coughs> pro 
problem is, of course, uh, where do you go and check these things? So if you want to do it right and you want to, uh, let's say, do diligence and you want to know uh, multiple sides of the story, where, where do you start and where does it end? Um, it's better to be safe than uh, sorry, I would say. So, but you also don't want to destroy somebody uh, without any grounds. Uh, and one of the examples, not connected to sexual harassment, but at one point I found out that uh, we check a lot of the files. We check all the files with WordPress Photo. And in New York, uh, a photographer was uh, the Whisper Network talked about. Uh, that, uh, that he was uh, one of the, the photographers that had been excluded from the contest. And it took me quite some time to call a lot of people in the industry to say, no, it's not, it's not him. Uh, I hear these whispers, so you kind of, you stand up for somebody to, to make sure that uh, these accusations uh, that are not true do not uh, destroy somebody's career. That's one side. So there's there's a there's a there's a difficulty with the, the whisper network, but uh, it definitely serves, I think, a purpose. And it reaches you, right? Uh, yeah, it reaches me. I wish uh, lots of things would reach me more. I mean, uh, I would say uh, uh, bring them on, uh, because then uh, you can do something, or you should. I mean, then we need to do something, and we do check out uh, where to go next. But. Um, I would wish that there would be something else in place that would not that would replace this, uh, because it's a powerful tool and I think it's an important tool. A lot of women told me that they they actually use this list uh, to sort of yeah. protect each other, protect themselves. But it's not such a good sign that uh, this is necessary. I would say, um, yeah, it's it's. Um, I'm not so sure if there's a, a, an easy solution for that. Uh, because where does it start and where does it end? And, and what is uh, the definition of problematic behavior? You know, we speak a lot about, it's like speaking about a lot of things, and, uh, but where do we draw a line? And um, so in that sense, we haven't started yet. And what is the definition of sexual harassment? I mean, this was one of the issues that um, came up as a result of your reporting was that if we don't, like we can argue till we're blue in the face over sexual harassment, but if we have different ideas of what it is, then that conversation's never really going to be resolved. One of the issues in the reporting uh, over seven and that I was involved in is the question is, if you say to a woman, I bet you like to be fucked up the arse, does that constitute sexual harassment or not? Yes. <laughs> there are some people in Seven who don't believe it does. So, that, and that's where we have the problem of. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that Anastasia and I have talked about at different points is that when you have this conversation a lot with men, one of the first things that comes up is, well, what is the right way to hit on a woman at, in a professional setting? Which is. Kind of alarming because that's like the bottom of what most women are worried about. They're not like, how am I ever going to date a photojournalist again in the current climate? <laughs> and yet this is something that comes up again and again. And then when you read stories like, like Kristen's, um, and as far as I was right, maybe some people disagree that what she just described is sexual misconduct. But most of the stuff in that story is pretty clear that it is. Like chasing people around parties, trying to kiss them, and like putting your hand on someone's genitalia in a professional setting, like, it's not that people didn't realize this stuff was sexual misconduct, it's that they didn't realize that they would ever be held accountable for it. And I think we're quite far from the situation in which no one ever dates each other again in, our, in the field of work that we're in. Like, enough people are going out with other journalists <laughs> that it's not, like, the biggest issue. Um, but it is something that comes up and maybe, like, I don't know if anyone else has experiences of having these conversations and how we get across like the difference because maybe maybe it's true that there are lots of men who are confused about whether what they're doing is sexual misconduct. It seems like they aren't just being idiots. Like they probably don't know. I, I, I yeah, that is of course uh, says a man uh, sitting on a stage. Uh, <laughs> 
because yeah, that's but that's 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 a that's a bigger issue in society now. I mean, one of the let's say good things of the Me Too is that uh, definitely this is now being talked about, and uh, that uh, makes men more vul vulnerable, which is also and can use a little bit of vulnerability, I would say. Uh, that's also a good thing. So. I was just thinking when we talked about uh, what is the role of, of men in this, uh, maybe it's our role to finally shut up a little bit and and uh, leave space for women to to take the to have the lead on this, which I, I feel they have actually. I mean, uh, the fact that a lot of men are hesitant to to participate in this is also because they feel vulnerable. And guys don't like to be vulnerable. It's not cool to talk about this. Um, but we cannot, if you make it unavoidable, if you keep putting this issue on a stage, I think uh, at one point uh, it has to, it has to happen, it has to give in. Um, but yeah, uh, we spoke about it as well, I mean, what is our role in this? And so we want to play a role, but we're also sort of uh, scouting out the territory every time we in, because at one point you don't want to be f say oh, yeah, I'm the champion of diversity and I do so many things I mean I appreciate your words but I'm a little bit hesitant to 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 uh, to accept them because um, yeah I, I'm not sitting here to 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 draw this applause or to 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 hear this but so it's our role to invite men to be part of this conversation, but I would definitely say that women should uh, keep the lead in this, make it difficult for us. I completely agree with that sentiment. Um, at the same time, there's no way that any you know, actual change can happen without the participation of men, um, just because of the roles that they inhabit in this industry. So the challenge, I think, for women and for the movement and for men, is how to find a way, for, how, how do, do the women in the movement engage the men, um, and how do the men contribute in a way that is done um, in a way that that is, that is participatory, but without an ownership of it, in a sense. Um, and maybe I'm not articulating it as well as I should, and maybe that's part of the problem because we don't necessarily have the language or the, the, the right way of talking about this, but I do see that as a challenge. I do see that as, as, um, as an issue that it would be good to have these, these bigger players and the men, the men and the women in the industry, but as we've noted, the HR and the PR departments of these big institutions often run interference. And so, in what ways can, can, can people in this industry uh, as individuals, uh, such as myself or other men in this room, or other photographers, um, really sort of spread out this, this kind of effort to just improve things, even incrementally. Yes, we need the institutional change. Yes, we need to come up with these ideas about best practices on an individual level like you're doing with your contracts, on an institutional level like you're doing with World Press. Mm -hmm and like Eddie Adams' workshop did with restructuring the whole way that they do things, um, right down to not serving alcohol at the portfolio reviews and making sure they finish by midnight and making sure everybody is, has, an, has an escort back to their hotel. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, World Press didn't do their last night party uh, this year, was that no. right? No. Right? And yeah. So that's, you don't want to be creating an atmosphere where these kinds of things can happen. I don't know if that's the reason why it was not helpful. Yeah, it's one of the reasons where I said, uh, are we in the industry to pay for a big party? Maybe we should, but a uh, party is always nice. But uh, why would I be responsible for uh, creating a situation where things like this clearly have happened? And how else can those resources be used in terms of... Exactly, I would rather spend them diverse. elsewhere, but right. uh, I also get a lot of uh, uh, backlash on that, you know. Well, everybody wants because, a free uh, drink, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, and so I think I think there are two challenges. There are challenges. There's the challenge for the men to to step forward and engage. And if they're not sure how to do that, then ask their female colleagues how to do that. And I think also for women who are pushing this movement forward to try and engage men as allies as best they can individually, as well as in, on the institutional level, because I think there is a risk of of alienation that happens there. Um, 
and and men can feel threatened. It is this this idea of, of you know losing the privilege or or it being a competition, and ultimately. And that's fair, you know, on the work front, or in the, everybody wants to get the best picture or the good assignment or whatever it might be. Um, but I think ultimately it's in everybody's best interest to to collaborate on this. And the people who are going to uh, move the conversation and improve the industry are the ones who are willing to reach across that gender divide um, to shift things in the right direction. And and I can give a few specific examples for men who are listening and want to know what, what they can do. I mean, beyond the individual um, actions like um, listening to your female colleagues, uh, believing them, not um, not talking shit about women who report these things, because that happens a lot in the industry. You become a complainer, you know? Don't do that. Um, but also I think men can use their power to push for institutional change, so men can go to their commissioning editors or their agencies and say, do we have a protocol for reporting harassment? Why don't we? Where is it? Are we implementing it? Uh, what about this woman who reported and nothing happened? Why Why didn't that happen? And, and they can speak pub publicly about it. Um, they can also, you know, I, when I was reporting the story, had um, men who didn't want to go on the record to corroborate women's stories because they didn't want to be associated with that. You know, they can speak publicly to support their colleagues. So I think there's a lot of uh, specific actions men can take to help push this forward and they can use their positions to do that. And, and visibility is important and, you know, uh, Speaking about it is powerful, but silence is even more fucking powerful. So, Visa Paul Image is the most important photojournalism uh, uh, festival uh, that's held every year in the south of France. This year, there was there was no uh, um, event in the programming that talked about the Me Too movement. So, the absence of those discussions also says to women, we don't care about your concerns. This is happening, and, and we don't think it's important enough to even talk about it. So I think speaking publicly about it, sharing articles. When I um, look at the people who shared or commented on Kristen's article, it was almost predominantly my female colleagues, with the exception of Lars and Finbar and about three other people. I called one of my best friends, who's a photojournalist. We went to university together. He's one of my closest friends. And I said, why didn't you share this article on Facebook when you don't even bother to share all of these articles on social media? I see that. I see that you're not paying attention to it. And beyond that, predators are also watching people's behavior. If we're not talking publicly about what happening, what, what is happening by sharing articles, by continuing conversations by agreeing to sit on panels, by hosting panels like this in the first place, by having an open conversation. We are telling women, we don't care about you, and we are telling predatory men as you were. On that uplifting note, <laughs> um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. I'm Alexia, I'm a sort of former photo editor. I worked at Reuters for years. Um, friends with Anastasia and Finbar. I just wanted to say that it's such a shame that we've got predominantly women in the room and that Lars is the only one who's the head of a major organisation in photojournalism that has come forward. It kind of feels like we're shouting into the wind or we're speaking to our friends. We need the head of Getty Images here. We need the director of photography of the Washington Post. We need these people here and we need them to admit that this stuff happens. I mean, the, the appalling behaviour of Seven has just set the absolute worst example. Um, and it just feels frustrating that until these kind of people are willing to step up, admit that it happens, talk about why certain people leave their organisation very quietly, you know. Um, and that's the kind of pressure, as well as amongst our peers, is the people that have the ear of the heads of these large organisations men and women, men maybe more so than women, frankly, need to be putting pressure on. And this, this kind of panel, you should be saying, we can't do it unless we get you, you and you to come and sit up here with us. I think one of the things that we talked about beforehand um, with Vaughn is that this may become a more regular conversation posted here. 
um, possibly quarterly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I think the idea is that this is the very start of a push to keep that very conversation going, and hopefully at some point there will be enough progress um, and willingness from the kind of people that you're talking about to come forward and to sit on the stage and have those conversations as well. But the point absolutely will take it, I think. I, think, I don't think there's enough incentive for them to change, so I think it's a little bit, uh, 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 it's not a nice answer, but that's also why I'm sitting here. I think there's not enough incentive for them to really change, so uh, the only thing we can do is keep the conversation high. I, I did an interview with the Dutch newspaper following up Kristen's article, and I did it on purpose because I wanted to see what, it, what kind of... Uh, response it would uh, get and uh, also to see if we could keep the um, topic high on the agenda but I'm not so optimistic about that because I have not seen so many people follow and I, I, I agree with you uh, on uh, the silence is sometimes telling and uh, I do speak about it and then I, I do realize that people are, it can be some, something be between being shy but also being told not to be involved, which is uh, the worst yeah. part, I would say. There's a lot of people being told, don't get involved. The legal department says no. HR department says no. So as long as we have that, uh, I would say uh, we should be sitting on this stage every week, uh, which gets us a lot of frequent flyer miles, which... <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it's, it's something really, uh, something that, that needs to happen. Because there's, there's one underlying thing that is deeply problematic. We talk about the industry, but this is not an industry. You know, there's nobody governing this industry. Nobody is in charge. Everybody's in charge. Freelancers are in charge. The president of such and so is in charge. The year is in charge. The, somebody is in charge of uh, a photo department. But it's all totally scattered. And uh, and it's it it's I think it's very very important that this um, if we keep talking about it as an industry, these big institutions should come together, and and let's say draw a certain uh, line and, and reach a certain common ground. Uh, now I'm optimistic and uh, maybe uh, not very realistic, but in very often I don't see uh, that there's a real. Uh, urgency for change yet and uh, and I think that's why we need to push this uh, much much more much much more than this um, because it's not gonna change people don't like to change change is difficult and this definitely needs to change and uh, yeah and so uh, we've I think we've just started Uh, I'm Alice, I'm a freelance um, I'm not sure if it is yes, yes, fine. Yes, okay. um, so I was speaking to a male photographer the other day and he was saying about how since Me Too he's found um, his work much more difficult and he's found access much more difficult and that he was saying that somebody really needs to be advocating for the male photographers and, um, <laughs> and, and I found the conversation really frustrating um, obviously and I just wondered if you could speak um, a bit more to the idea of, or the unpack this idea of um, ways that possibly male photographers are feeling threatened or anxious about their position now in this like new landscape, um, and also how to approach that when you meet it, and that if you're met with resistance in that way. Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this speaks exactly to the point that I was making earlier about this fear of losing that privilege, yeah. um, and. Certainly, there, there are, there are you know, a lot of um, organizations are assigning a more diverse range of photographers, not as, not, not a, not as diverse as, as, um, as is needed, but certainly there will be less work for people who look like me. Um, but that's a good thing uh, in terms of what people are seeing published, in terms of um, the representation of the world, but yeah, sure, it's going to make things perhaps more of a struggle for this particular photographer. But that's kind of like the the root of you know the the Trump nationalism. Like this is a this is a demographic that feels under threat, and so um, you know when you have people lamenting the the plight of you know the white male, I 
it's kind of hard to feel a whole lot of sympathy there, right? So, um, yeah, I think you maybe need to just set him a little bit straight. On that. Just tell him to welcome, welcome to the fair playing ground of good photography and good journalism. Ah, a lot of that. Hi, uh, uh, I'm Garrison O'Neill. I'm a photographer and uh, filmmaker. Uh, what can men who are not in high-level positions do to make sure that women can get on the front page uh, with their photographs without jeopardizing uh, their own career and trying to push that forward without taking over? Yeah. Wow. Uh... Yeah, be aware of uh, this uh, unbalance, which which is probably you are aware of it. Um, just speak about it. I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody to make way and to to lose a job or to. I mean, it's a very competitive uh, world. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, really important discussion. I'm um, I'm a Canadian journalist and author. I'm I'm 50. I wrote a book called Dancing in the No-Fly Zone, A Woman's Journey Through Iraq, came out over a decade ago, and I'm actually interested in asking, commenting on generational issues around Me Too, and the possibility of current and future intergenerational dialogue between women. Because uh, I started reporting from war zones in the 90s, when, when I was in my 20s, and my colleagues, I guess, were kind of stereotyped, you know, thrice divorced alcoholic hacks, old boys, mainly all men. But actually, they weren't so bad. It was um, when I was in a suburban Canadian newsroom that I experienced the worst kind of sexual and racialized abuse that left me feeling afterwards like I had PTSD, really. Uh, and there was no one to turn to, there was no one to talk to, there was no awareness of this, really. Uh, HR was definitely the enemy, not the ally. Um, so when I, you know, when I, I ended up leaving the sort of toxic workplace situation, but um, I'm still shocked that now at age 50 I have to deal with sexual harassment in the workplace because I sort of thought that something would magically happen when I turned 50 and I'd be respected by my male peers. Um, and I look at the women in this room and I think a lot of you are sort of millennials and I, I wonder, you know, is it getting better or worse? And how do we quantify it, and how can we sort of learn from each other as a generational experience? Um, I think that we were previously having this conversation about how a lot of um, institutions are now setting rules for how they will behave from this point on. And uh, Lars, you were saying that this, this is a moving forward point and a really safe space for them in which they're not going back and looking back on the problems that they just ignored completely. And I do know that as a millennial we are very clan forming of other millennials and that's a huge problem of ours. I think that we can learn a lot and hear a lot from older generations of women and also ask for their voices more in this because we need to. We also need you in this whisper network as well. I mean, not just this whisper network, but also this this world of understanding how we got to this point and how it, is it getting worse or has it gotten better since when you were on the field? I mean, we need we need your voice. We and, need your support. And me, me too didn't come out of nowhere. It is sitting on the shoulders of decades of work by feminist pioneers who led us to this point. Um, but it's interesting thinking about a generational divide also when it comes to responses to Me Too. And typically they seem to give or, give or take fall in the like below 40 attitudes and the over 40 year old attitudes. Um, and some of those difficult conversation, Alice, I think it was Alice mentioned earlier having a frustrating conversation with a male colleague. Since Kristen's article, three friends of mine and around the over 40 mark, it's not defined by over 40, but typically, right, have said to me, but you know, honestly, I really, I feel like I'm more discriminated against because I'm a white man these days. <laughs> so I, I feel those, those frustrations, and I also wonder about how, it's about how we talk about it. Like, young women are so fucking radical. It's true, and it's fantastic. Like. I spent the whole of my 20s hanging out with 
middle-aged or old white guys, career-wise, right? And it's only since I got new friends that I've managed to change my attitude. <laughs> so I don't know. I think I think there's a lot. I think there's a lot to be done there between bringing all the different generations of women together and the, the way we talk about it. Really important. But I did learn from conversations uh, with different generations that uh, the way we think about this topic today and the way, uh, let's say, the newsroom was uh, in the 60s or in the 70s was quite different. So some of them bring on the example of like the things we did in the 70s we could not do now anymore in the newsroom because we probably could get fired or uh, relationships between people on the work floor. Uh, uh, sometimes you hear also the other end where people become so uh, sort of uh, uh, afraid of these things that they don't socialize at all, which I also, also think is not a good solution. But yeah, I think uh, it's another part where you could sort of uh, scout out the territory and, and, and talk about it I mean, this, a lot of this is really about conversation and having this as a, a conversation uh, as an important topic. Uh, and I, th the good thing is that it's being talked about and that it is being discussed and that I think we find out things. Uh, yeah. Hi, thank, uh, thank you everyone. Um, I wondered, um, oh, oh, my name is Caroline Locker and I'm a, I've, I'm a comedian journalist and I've worked here at the BBC for many years. Um, I wonder if we could talk about the predators, because as Anastasia pointed out, you know, they are our colleagues and our friends, and having those difficult conversations, I think, is essential for people to notice that what they're doing is wrong. And I don't know, maybe the psychologist in the room can help us in how we can address these things with these people. But, you know, Lars, you mentioned you um, stopped using people that you had heard of a you know, had these bad behaviors, but I wondered, did you tell them why? Did you have that difficult conversation with them? And, or have any of you had to, that difficult conversation with someone who's done some, something very inappropriate? Because I think that takes a lot of courage, right? And that's the really difficult thing to do. So I just wonder from anybody who would like to give some I, I can speak with them, that's right, with anybody. I, I can speak about, yeah, uh, yeah you have these conversations, uh, which is, uh, I think we could build a Netflix series on conversations like this. <laughs> because this ranges from, uh, what, are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Who told you this? You know, it's like this very defensive uh, behavior. Uh, or uh, it's not true. Uh, and then of course, when more uh, proof comes out, it becomes very silent. You know, you don't, you don't speak. To, to them anymore, but uh, I also have this conversation because I think the, it's good to do it, but I'm also curious about it. Uh, uh, what is this? Why is this happening? And uh, I, I, think I, uh, I think it's important for an institution to explain very clearly to, to people why you don't want to work with them anymore. If it helps, I don't know, but at least it's something that uh, that you, that you should do. Um, I haven't experienced any follow-up uh, conversation because very often people that get exposed kind of disappear from uh, the radar. Maybe they're in the woods in Canada. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know, but uh, that's, I think that's also weird. You know, let's let's not let's not talk about it anymore. Let's hide a little bit and see if I can return to a job. But this is an interesting issue though, Lars. So if you had to let somebody go for one of these reasons, then what is the um, responsibility of an organization? Uh, okay. to I didn't I didn't have to let somebody go that no, no, worked sure, for me, sure. but I would but, but, but yeah. hypothetically speaking, this has happened where somebody's been let go, hired by another organization and then um, things were revealed that, that you know, so what is the what is the duty um, or the responsibility of organization that let somebody go on these grounds. Yeah. Um, do they are they obliged to say anything to protect? They're obliged not to. Right. right. So. Morally, uh, in this case, uh, the person got uh, let's say, let's say three weeks later, the whole story broke. So, 
that's an easy solution for me. Uh, I would say I'm honest about it because that at that moment you you you're like okay, so it's now out there and people know about it. Uh, I have not been into a situation where you uh, openly have to announce that you stop working with somebody. Do you have a sense of whether organizations should should do though? I think that's a, that's the big uh, elephant in the room for many because we've seen now, we've learned that a lot of organizations uh, hush people out and uh, they get hired elsewhere and they continue this behavior. So the predators are the worst uh, of all because they clearly can uh, thrive in, in situations like this. Uh, and time will tell if this has changed and if institutions or uh, industries, uh, like organizations have change this uh, this uh, perspective or uh, to, to actively ask for references uh, but if you ask for a reference and nobody tells you anything then you're pretty complicit aren't you and I think a lot of people feel pretty bad about it but still don't talk about it and uh, that is really really problematic yeah. Kristen you've I don't know if you've had actual conversations with perpetrators but you've had to have some interaction with them in the course of your reporting, right? I wonder yeah. how that played out well, for you, or how, what the process was. I th yeah, I think it's different than sort of the, you know, the other kind of conversations, because it's in the context of, you know, I'm going to publish this story about what you did, uh, what is your response? <laughs> so, um, and that varies from, you know, a, lo a whole lot of emails to a sentence to nothing at all. Um, so, it's you know, but usually defensiveness. Um, but but I think this issue of um, of organizations hiding behind uh, you know legal reasons to not act is is a big problem. And it was you know something that was um, that uh, that I wrote about in my article that um, men are you know quietly leave organizations and the organization doesn't say anything, presumably for legal reasons, um, and, and the man just goes on to get hired elsewhere. Um, and I'm a member of an organization, uh, the Frontline Freelance Register, that um, it has a member who was accused uh, of rape and of sexual harassment uh, by two women, and the organization hasn't um, kicked him out because um, they feel that they can't do that unless he is um, convicted in a court of law for legal liability reasons. So I think it's it's an issue in many different um, organizations, even ones that, um, you know, protect, that work to protect journalists. And I think this brings to the point of how important organizations and also policymakers are in this world. Naturally, women, and I think also our psychoanalysts here can attribute to this, but naturally women do not want to talk or deal with our perpetrators because it's it's just a safety reaction. You don't want to. I mean, if you do, and if you do confront those people, it's unsafe for you. You you can be threatened even more, and you don't want to put yourself in those situations. So we have nowhere to go, and unless people at the top are acting and taking advantage of their privilege, <laughs> we're stuck. And those men will conti continuously cycle through men and women who are in these situations. I can't wait to speak that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can also talk a little bit about, um, I've worked in places where issues like this have come up um, and I've heard the HR legal side of things um, and I've heard everything from like language, like this is a family, we keep it within the family and um, we need a cone of silence around this and things that are really problematic and um, one of the reasons why this issue is so upsetting for pe people who work in journalism or photojournalism is that we went into these careers a lot of the time with these idealistic notions of like shedding light where there's darkness and illuminating injustice and then realizing that in some way you're complicit in covering up this as an industry. Um, and what does that reckoning look like? I think this is why whisper networks are important. It's why leaks happen. It's why people talk to the media because you're not allowed to otherwise, and it does mean that every time you do speak out, you're putting your job on the line. Um, but is there a point in being a journalist and just telling stories about other people when there are stories within your own industry? And like that's something that everyone needs to decide for themselves, but when you hear these things, if you don't do due diligence, if you don't ask people who you know 
should we hire this person? And you, if you don't go in there with an open mind and people, people will sense whether you really want to hear a story or not. Like, people know whether you're asking for a reference that confirms someone worked somewhere or whether you're saying, I kind of heard some dodgy stuff about this guy. Like, can you look into this for me and come back? Because, yeah, most people aren't going to be convicted in a court of law, um, but we still have to do something to protect our staff. Thank you. Um, Laura's defense for you, I think uh, the question the front got to a bit of what I wanted to ask about. Um, I'm wondering how many photographers have you stopped working with since you guys have been doing this? And you said a couple times in different ways, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot for this, but you are the only person representing a large organization. Um, you said that you wish there was a different system for Whisper Networks. Sometimes you don't know where to put accusations, why not create a place? Can you do that so that there is a, a, a box or a, a realm that this can go into that is not subject to individual editors who are dispersed around the world? Um, and then I'd like to hear from Anastasia, uh, Kristen, and Yuna. Um, because of the gray areas involving what may or may not enter a court of law, or what may or may not fit one definition of sexual harassment versus another, what do you think we can do? Because Lars mentioned not wanting to ruin someone's life, but that, that very uh, charitable sentiment in the process can leave a lot of uh, men and women exposed to what they consider to be predatory behavior. So what do you think we can do beyond Whisper Networks? How would you encourage action? Um, I think the first part was directed to me. Um, I have a lot of conversations in, uh, in my organization, also with my supervisory board about this. Should we uh, create a safe place? And uh, then we do talk about uh, what is the purpose of my organization, and where did we? Why? Uh, why did it? Uh, why did it start it? What is the things that we do? So when I say that we are, uh, we should be more than a contest, and we are more than a contest. Then uh, this leadership role is becoming very important. And so I haven't, we haven't figured it out yet, but it's definitely something that we talk about. Can we create a? Uh, can we facilitate a person to be totally independent and to aggregate this stuff? And then, of course, after you know that it will aggregate a lot, where where does it go? Um, that's so. Yeah, I, 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 we're up against. Uh, we have we have this challenge, and we need to see if we can meet it. Uh, this is where I feel that uh, that we should not be doing this alone. I think we should find ways to bring in more organizations that are willing and daring to, to be part of that. Uh, and the, the other part was the... Uh, I'm not saying that I should be... Um, uh, we should not be uh, protecting people from... Uh, you know, I, I, I know this problematic thing about uh, if it's not... Uh, has not been to court, or nobody has been convicted, we, uh, we cannot do anything. Um, We've been acting on things uh, without uh, any court uh, involved. I mean, this is really where we find information, we exchange this information. If we don't like the answer, or the answer is not clear enough, or not satisfying enough, then I'd rather be safe than sorry. Um, but then the, the, yeah, the other part is uh, we haven't had uh, a situation where, let's say, you feel uh, or you, you needed to expose somebody. It, it depends how. Uh, problematic the behavior is. In, in many ways uh, it is not always connected to sexual behavior. Uh, I, I've, we speak a lot about uh, with people about misusing their power. Uh, we drafted rules for people that nominate talent for our uh, Yosart masterclass uh, that we do not want them to misuse this power. And we've already clearly found out that uh, people do if I nominate you, you will do uh, some, uh, some uh, work for me or you will help me with this shoot. And so I don't want any of that shit. Uh, 
uh, if you nominate somebody, that it should be for recognition, like uh, like you call for, to, to to make sure that people get uh, get what uh, they deserve. So it's it's a very often with uh, power. But uh, if I would find out about sexual predators, uh, that would be for me the first one to really act uh, quite forcefully, because that's uh, I think uh, the worst. I guess it's maybe a bit unfair for me to speak because my my um, experience with being a victim in the workforce led me to step away from the journalism industry. But um, I mean, now my contracts are very clear in which I just will not work on any sort of assignment which I'm going to be potentially in one of those situations again um, without my rights clearly stated that I'm I have the right to leave if I am put in a situation which I define as uncomfortable I mean I'm not going to use that um, just for fun, just to be like, I don't want to work, you know, like I want to do my job, I love my job, and I'm good at my job, and I also want to be able to keep a good stance with the people that I work with, so of course I'm not going to abuse that, but um, I do think it's my right to be able to create what I will and will not work with, and um, I think that very few women realize that we have that right, and um, I think that men often do, which is why they end up getting paid a lot more than we do, and they end up having a lot better um, contracts than we do. Um, so yeah, I've basically just become the monster woman that's like, I won't work for X, Y, and Z, and um, sorry, but I will rather shoot fashion editorials than <laughs> work in a journalism industry that doesn't protect me, unfortunately. But we're working on it. That's why we're here. <laughs> I think when those when these complaints come up that are you know the what we call gray areas, he said, she said, um, you know we don't have evidence. Um, you know it's um, I think it's those areas can be difficult. Um, I think we all know that very few cases of um, rape and sexual assault and sexual harassment are tried in a court of law. So if that's our standard. We're going to let a lot of predators go loose. Um, I think that um, there are, you know, <laughs> steps that organizations can take to investigate, um, like Lars is doing, and and um, you know, come up with a code of conduct. Um, and when people violate that code of conduct, you, you do an investigation and and you take action. Um, you know, I I don't think that's necessarily easy. But I think if we if we just put things off because they're too difficult, we're we're not going to solve this problem. So we have to be bold and and step out and and take action. Um, and I think you know implementing codes of conduct and and you know I understand it's not easy for organizations to to do those um, investigations, but I think that they have to be they have to be done. And um, you know the, I think sometimes the people who complain about ruining someone's life by with like an investigation and firing someone from a job are the same people who complain about the whisper networks ruining people's lives without due process. So, you know, what are we going to what are we going to do here? Um, we can we can continue to use whisper networks or we can um, create credible credible ways to hold people accountable and and if they are not guilty, you know, then then they won't be fired or whatever. And it's also I think a misnomer to say that someone's life is ruined because they're held accountable for what their, for their actions. And your organization will probably end up creating better stories just because you have a very high standard of what you're willing to bring on to your team. Um, we live in a world of fast, fast media and if we can really cut it down to the people who are the best at what they do, <coughs> it's just a no-brainer for the organizations as well.